the word of the Lord tonight is certainly this is one of the most exciting parts of this study that we've been in. We're going to begin with verse number 17. This is Revelation chapter 21, part 42. This is the part that um, I like to sit around and daydream about. Uh, some folks want to sit around and talk about, you know, whether there's different dimensions of hell and punishment and I don't want to dwell on that. This is what I like to dwell on right here. Verse 17 said, And he measured the wall thereof, an hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. Now, if you remember in, in uh, verse 16, he measured in furlongs. That was roughly one-eighth of a mile. And I say roughly because their measurements and our measurements are different. We also mentioned last week that Vincent, who is the Greek scholar, uh, he said that 12,000 furlongs would be 1,378.97 miles. And that's where we get the term that the city was approximately 1,500 miles square. Now the scripture, of course, tells us that it was 1,500 miles wide, high, and also in the breadth of it. So the 1,500 miles square here is because he measured it in furlongs. But here, in verse 17, these are not furlongs. Here he's measuring in cubits. The measurement's going to be different. Now, the word cubit in the Greek is cubitus, and it means the elbow. And it was the word was a reference to a measurement from the tip of the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, if you put your hand straight up. Now, that was based upon a person being six foot. I'm six foot, and mine from my elbow to the tip of my finger is 19 inches. So you can see how it would vary there. And so 144 cubits would then be equal to 216 feet. And that's determining if it was a six foot man and the elbow to the tip of the finger was 18 inches long. However, it does appear from some measurements that were found in the pyramids of Egypt that the cubit was at least, in some cases, as much as 21 inches long. So that's why we use approximations, because we certainly don't know. Mr. Morris suggested in his commentary that this dimension is referring to the width of the wall and not necessarily the height of the wall, because such a low height for the wall would not relate with the tremendous height of the city, end of quote. Of course, we've said many times in this study that um, until our eyes behold that city for ourselves, we're not going to know. A whole lot of speculation here when you start listening to commentators trying to give their interpretation of this, so we're going to have to wait and see. But it really does seem, when you read the scripture, that it does seem like the dimensions are actually referring not to the width, not to how thick the walls are, but actually the height of the wall. And it is true that the walls do or the city does soar far above the height of the walls. Some scholars say it would in turn permit the light from the city to shine forth with more brilliance into the rest of the creation. The city, if it's going to be 1,500 miles tall, we don't even think about what 1,500 miles really is. Satellites orbit the earth about 120 miles above the earth. And if each floor were 120 to 125 miles above each other, then you can certainly see that the first floor above us from one level would be at the level that satellites are orbiting at. So a, a wall that's uh, 216 feet tall doesn't seem like anything but a small drainage ditch compared to what that city is going to be like. In fact, it would even be a small drainage ditch. For that city. Also, if you remember last week, we mentioned that the wall of this city is not for protection because there are no enemies there. The wall, most scholars will agree that it is for beauty and its purpose is to eternally declare the names of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. Again, we've talked about the significance of numbers in this study. And the number 12 is certainly significant, and it's certainly emphasized primarily in this chapter. There's 12 gates. There's 12 angels standing at those gates. There's 12 foundations to a city that's 12,000 furlongs square. There's a wall that's 12 times 12 cubits high. We've mentioned in this study before that the number 7, it seems to 
uh, imply a perfection of God's creation or his economy. And the number 12 speaks of a completion of God's plan. And this may be symbolic that God's plan has finally come to a predetermined end. By referring to this as the cubit of a man, we were meant to understand this as an ordinary cubit. It's not spiritualized here. It was a human measurement. And the scripture said here that it was the measurement, the angel's cubit was the measurement of a man. He appeared as a man. Verse 17, and he measured the wall thereof and hundred and forty and four cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, uh, of the angel, which implies the height of an ordinary man is what was intended. He was not a beast, he was not a creature, he was not great, he was not mighty, he was about the height of a man, a six-foot man, and so this was the length of a human measuring rod, 18 inches. So if the measurement of an ordinary man was six foot, it may have had some kind of a symbolic reference to the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles that were mentioned in Revelation 21 and 12 because the, uh, they represented the 12 gates and then the 12 apostles represented the 12 thresholds or the 12 foundations. If you add them together, you have 24. And that's the number of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles together. Multiply that by six and you have precisely 144. So the number 12 apparently has great significance here. And we certainly don't know, know all the significance of that number. Verse 18 said, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper. And the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. Now, people often say that the city was paved with gold. The Bible doesn't say that. Here it says the city was pure gold, not just the foundation, not just the floor. And some people like to say it was paved. Well, when you pave over something, you cover something that's, you know, you got the bad stuff on the bottom, you put the good stuff on the top. But this gold is transparent. You're not going to look below it and see bad stuff. It's described here as gold. It's like unto clear glass. I can assure you no human eye has ever seen or been able to imagine what this must have looked like because uh, there, though there's a lot of architectural beauty in the world today, uh, these buildings and these architects can in no way compare to this image that John saw of this beautiful city. In verse 11, we're told that the um, the glow of light that radiates from the city, it was like a jasper stone. But here, we're told the entire wall was made of jasper. Jasper stone, according to most scholars, and it didn't matter what dictionary I looked this up in, this seems to be a mystery stone. Because nobody seems to know for sure what kind of stone this is. Mr. Morris wrote in his commentary that the exact nature of the jasper stone is uncertain, but it was renowned in the ancient world. And although its name has been translated from both Greek and Hebrew as well as other languages, it still remains an unidentified stone today. It was one of the stones in the breastplate of the high priest in Exodus 28, 20, Exodus 39 and 13, and also it was used in the heavenly Eden, according to Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. Its association with the Sardin stone in Revelation 4 and 3, and with the clear crystal in Revelation 21, 11, together with other biblical references, seems to suggest that it was a fine, translucent stone capable of projecting different colors, primarily radiant white, but also with flashing red and purple tints, end of quote. Not only does that cap capture our attention that this wall is made of brilliant jasper, but it's hard for our minds to even comprehend that the city itself is made of gold. Now, people talk about finding the, you know, the gold rush and people were finding nuggets and finding dust. But this is a city 1,500 miles square and it's made of gold. That's a lot of gold. That's a whole lot of gold. The two words that are used here is pure and clear. 
Both of these two words come from the very same Greek word and they emphasize the purity and flawlessness and beauty of this city. In fact, uh, commentators de describe this as perfect. It's like no building in the world because the buildings of the world will soon be torn down to make room for more progressive structures. But this city is so perfect, it will never be replaced. Verse 19 said, And the foundation of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, a chalcedony. The fourth, an emerald. The fifth, a sardonyx. The sixth, a sardius. The seventh, a chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, a topaz. The tenth, a chrysophrysus, the eleventh, a jacinth, the twelfth, an amethyst. The more you read the description of this, if it was one floor that was one stone, the next floor up, the next stone, and the next floor up, the next stone, your mind can't even imagine that foundations like this are made. And when you read the description of these stones that the foundations are made of, it automatically causes your imagination to be stretched beyond its limits. We cannot even imagine how glorious and how beautiful that city is going to be. Amen. Now commentators suggest here, and this is a description of the colors of these stones, that jasper may be gold in color, appearing like clear glass in substance, namely glass with a gold tint or cast to it. Sapphire is a stone similar to a diamond in hardness and blue in color. A chalcedony is an agate stone from Chalcedon in Turkey. It's thought to be sky blue with other colors running through it. And some say it's a stone that grows from the outside in. If you take one of these chalcedony stones and you break it down the middle, it's hollow inside because it's believed to grow from the outside in. The emerald is a stone that is bright green in color. The sardonyx is a red and white stone. Sardius refers to a common jewel of reddish color. It's also found in a honey color, which is considered less valuable. The sardius is used with jasper in Revelation 4 and 3 to describe the glory of God around the throne. A chrysolite is a transparent stone. It's golden in color and therefore somewhat different from the modern pale green chrysolite stone that is known today. Beryl is a sea green stone. Topaz is a yellow green and transparent stone. Chrysophrysus is a stone that introduces another shade of green. Jacinth is a violet color. Amethyst is commonly a dark purple color. And then commentators say that the precise colors of these stones in some cases are not certain. But the general picture here described by John is one of unmistakable beauty that apparently is designed to reflect the glory of God in a spectrum of brilliant colors. The light of the city, the Bible said, will be the light, uh, will be the lamb that shines there. And it's going to be shining through all of these various colors of the foundation uh, that make up this wall, the wall being of clear jasper. To our imagination, it seems like a dazzling image that sparkles and it shines and it glistens. And it was perhaps intended to show the beauty or the glory, reflect the glory of God and the brilliance of his holiness. Something our minds cannot even comprehend. Commentators suggest that the city is undoubtedly far more beautiful to the eye than anything man has ever been able to create or even imagine and it reflects not only the infinite wisdom and power of God but also his grace that has been extended to the objects of his salvation that's us and there is no way that we can grasp the beauty and splendor of this city what what this beauty and this of this city will reveal to those who are privileged to live there the stones that are being described here by John, they're not recognized by any certainty. Uh, nobody can say they know what it is with any certainty in this generation. But it does remind us also that the scripture tells us that the glories that certainly await the children of God, those are unsearchable and they're indescribable. 
We know the Bible said that eyes have not seen, neither ears heard, neither have it entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. We know that's a quote from Isaiah. It's talking about the coming day of salvation when the truth would be revealed to babes and sucklings. It would not be to the wise and the prudent, but to those that had a hunger in their heart. But the scripture could also be used here in the same focus because we cannot possibly describe what it's going to be like when we get there and see the Lord face to face. Some scholars are of the opinion that these 12 stones will actually make up the foundations of the wall of the city. And they separate these three or separate these as being equally three on each side. Of course, John doesn't give us that description, so that's nothing more than speculation. We would normally think when he describes the first uh, foundation was jasper, we would normally think that he's talking about layers. There's one of jasper, there's another one of sardon. All of these that are leveled or layered out there, we would describe it that way. But the foundation stone here mentioned as jasper being the first, we don't know if that's the bottom and the rest are built on top of that, or if he's describing the top, and then he's counting all the way down 12 stones. Verse 21 said, In the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. That means each gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. It's not paving over something that's that's dirty or fill dirt or rocks underneath, it's transparent. There's no descriptions that are given here as far as the dimension or the size of the gates of the city. We're told they're made of pearl. Uh, most will suggest that they're at least as high as the wall, which would make them 216 feet tall. We can't imagine a gate that big. We can't imagine a, a gate that high to welcome people that are privileged to live there. But we do find in verse number 12 that an angel stands at each one of these gates. Also the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, they're eternally inscribed in that gate. But now we're confronted with this uh, astonishing image here of this city because the gates are made of one single pearl. Obviously, no one's ever found a pearl that big. There's no, there's no sea urchin that's got a belly big enough for a 216-foot pearl. And of course, this one must have hinges on it, I suppose. The singular reference, in fact, let me mention about this too. The Bible here says that it was made of one pearl, each one of one pearl. Most scholars throw this off like they do Jonah being swallowed by a great fish. And they say it's symbolic because there's no such thing as a pearl that big. Neither is there streets of gold. Now you may go to TBN and see them paint their walls and chairs gold, but it's not real. It might be gold rust-oleum, but what's under it's going to corrupt. You may go to Donald Trump's house and he may have a, a gold inlay on one of his doors, but if... Uh, he, there's nothing like this and no one's got a pearl that's this size. But that's what makes it so mind-boggling that God somehow makes gates. To us, gate, you just put it up to keep dogs out or kids in. But this gate is made of one single pearl and the God that makes that pearl inside of an oyster or a clam, that same God is able to make them as big as he wants them to be. Amen. The singular reference here to the street of the city presents some interesting questions. Uh, people have asked, and in fact commentators ask the question, believing this is not uh, literal as well, how can there be just one street in a city that's this size? Well, the word street here is taken from the Greek word that also is used in Revelation 11:8, where it speaks about the body of the two witnesses. They will lie in the street of Jerusalem. We know, of course, Jerusalem has a lot more than just one street. The same word is also translated as streets, plural, in other places like Matthew 6 and 5, Luke 10 and 10, Acts chapter 5, verse 15. I think we could safely say if there's 12 gates there, if there's 12 angels at those gates, there's going to be 12 streets or broad ways that are going to lead into that city. 
And John said that the streets, the street is a pure gold. It's like transparent glass. Again, we can't possibly relate to that because we've never seen gold that's transparent. Some scholars suggest that the gold will be so pure that that is what will make it transparent. That's speculation. We don't know that, but I like to imagine it anyway. Verse 22, he said, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. No temple, no building there. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. One thing that's been very prominent to both Israel and the church has been the places of worship. To Israel, it was their temple. To the church, it's wherever two or three come and gather together in his name. Ezekiel described a beautiful temple during the millennial reign where people would come from far and near, they would come to that temple to learn the word of God. The word temple here is a Greek word that also means a dwelling, a shrine, or a temple. In Alfred's commentary, he wrote, the whole city is now the temple, and the shape of the city is like that of the holies of holies. The presence of God will saturate all the city, and so all the redeemed are gathered, are already within the city, and so all the redeemed are already within the city where they're all now priests unto God. There is therefore no temple within the city because the whole city itself is the temple, the object of all worship, God. And the great sacrifice, which was the lamb, are both there already, end of quote. Morris wrote in his commentary, he said, but then also the lamb is said to be the temple of it. Both God in his infinite majesty and God in his suffering humanity are one, both together as the God-man, comprising the holy temple in which he will dwell eternally with his own people, his both by virtue of creation and by right of redemption. There is no temple there because there will be no eternal gathering place to worship God like we have now and will have during the millennium because the spirit and presence of God will permeate the whole city. We mentioned last week that when the scripture described the city as being four square, 1,500 miles in length, breadth, and height, when we describe that, we also mention that scholars will point out that it was the same thing when the Bible spoke of many things that were described. The holies of holies was considered to be a four square uh, uh, dimension. The breastplate of the priest was a four square dimension. And so symbolically here it was saying the same thing. It's the dwelling place of God. It describes in symbolism the inner sanctum that God is going to dwell and his people aren't going to come to a temple. The whole place is going to be the dwelling place of God and so there'll be no place to dwell or a place to go to make an appointment with God. He's going to fill all of that city. Now verse 23 said, and the city had no need of the sun not talking about the earth here. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the lamb is the light thereof. Notice here that it said the city had no need of the sun. That does not mean that the sun will cease to shine. It doesn't mean the moon is going to cease to exist to those that dwell here on the earth. They're still going to depend upon the sun and the moon for their light. But it would appear here that the sun and the moon, they're going to shine upon the new earth, but the city, New Jerusalem, is going to have a light of its own. It's going to be provided by the Lord God himself. Now, we don't understand how that's going to happen. We don't understand how that light's going to permeate through walls and, and levels and all of that. But we know that somehow... The, the glory of God is going to illuminate the entire city. It doesn't appear here in the description of John that this light is coming from some great source of light. He's not pointing out that there's a source of light there that's shining brightly throughout the city as a, a, a spotlight or a lamp above that. But he's talking here about the glory of God will reach or permeate throughout the city. There's no place in that city where the glory of God, the light of his glory, will not reach. Someone said one time, we don't expect to see any shadows there. 
We can't even imagine that. The glory of God illuminated the sky for Israel during their a sojourn in the wilderness with a pillar of fire, the Bible said, by night, Exodus 13, 22. For 40 years, that pillar followed them. It hovered above the camp of Israel, directly over the Ark of the Covenant that was housed in the Holies of Holies in the tabernacle. And that same glory of the Lord we mentioned last week, it filled the tabernacle when the Ark of the Covenant was brought in, and it filled the temple when the Ark of the Covenant was brought in there. It was so powerful, the Bible said, the priests were not able to minister there. In fact, they were not able to enter it until the glory had lifted. That same glory that man could not stand back then because it was so radiant and so powerful that glory is going to illuminate this city and we're going to live in the midst of it verse 24 said and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it this is a very fascinating scripture here first of all this lets us know that there will be nations of people that will be dwelling there now this is interesting because if you look at the root word for nations, the word is actually translated Gentiles in other places in the scripture. So this was not a reference here necessarily to divisions of people on the earth that we have the European nations, we have the Asian nations, we have Northern and, and, and uh, Southern American nations. No, it's not talking about those kind of nations. It's referring to the fact that they're Gentiles from all over the planet nations that have been saved and are walking here there's no scriptural re reason here that we should doubt that there's going to be nations multitudes of people that are dwelling on the earth then we are going to rule and reign over somebody and something we're not going to be in that city ruling and reigning over each other we're going to rule and reign over something and so that's going to be those that are here upon the earth. This may be, in fact, what Jesus was referring to in Matthew 25 when he spoke of the time when nations would be separated at the time of his return. He said some of these nations in chapter 25, they would be considered as goat nations. They were the ones that would be put on the left and they would be eternally lost. Others would be considered the sheep nations. They would be eternally saved. Their salvation had to do with their attitude toward and treatment toward God's people. Matthew 25, 45, Jesus said, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. He was talking about their attitude, their neglect. Now Matthew 5 and 5 also assured us, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth the new earth. We're going to rule and reign over someone. In the beginning, God placed man in the garden. The first command that, that God gave to man was found in Genesis 1.28. The Bible said, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Do you realize that if man would not have eaten of that forbidden fruit, that he would have lived eternally in that paradise of God forever. His seed would have lived there in the paradise of God forever. But obviously disobedience and sin broke that hope, robbed man of ever knowing the joys of living in an earth that was blessed by God. And yet it would appear here that that's exactly what John is describing to us this is going to be a place where man can eternally live in the presence of God without sin or temptation. A world we can't even imagine. It's going to be a world that's going to be renewed. It's going to be wonderfully changed where the people of God are going to dwell there. They're going to walk in the light of that city of God. Now, by the mention here of the kings of the earth, this does not mean, he's not talking here about the kings of the earth that ruled over those nations prior to the restoration of all things. We don't think it's a reference to the nations that are here now. Uh, it's not uh, applied to entire nations. He's not going to look and say, well, the nation of, of uh, uh, whatever, they're a good nation, so I'm going to save the whole nation. He's not talking about that. Because there's no way 
that there's ever going to be anybody that will ever enter into that new earth who were ungodly, that were sinners, that's not going to enter there. All sin to this point has already been judged. Those that were sinners were already cast into the lake of fire. So we have no direct statement from the word of God here concerning who exactly who these people are. Again, we're left to our own speculation as to their identity. Needless to say, this is going to present some problems here. At the end of the millennium, I want you to consider after 1,000 wonderful years in which the Lord reigned on the earth, the Bible tells us as the King of kings and Lord of lords, there have been a lot of people that have been born here on this earth during that period of time of 1,000 years. They don't have glorified bodies. The longevity of life has been restored back to them again. If you remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago. The longevity of life's been restored, but for a thousand years, there's going to be people born. I wonder how many people could be born on an earth when the devil is bound for a thousand years. How many people could be born here that are going to be alive at the end of a thousand years? Well, I can tell you, I don't know the number, but there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be born, that are going to be saved during that number that are neither part of the children of Israel nor are they part of the church. If you remember, we had a reference in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9 to the camp of the saints that Satan brought a host against. Those are obviously these people that are going to inhabit the new earth along with the children of Abraham. And yet this raises another question. Somebody said, well, if they don't have glorified bodies, what's going to happen to them when the earth is burned up, when it's purged with fire? Well, we were faced with the same problem a few uh, uh, chapters ago when we talked about those that stood before the white throne judgment. The obvious difference here is the group that stood before the white throne judgment, they were all called forth from the dead. So all those that stood before God at the white throne judgment, they already had their eternal bodies. They were already with eternal bodies. These at the, uh, on the earth at the end of the millennium, they don't have glorified bodies. They don't have an eternal body. But if God could transport Enoch and Elijah, take them off the earth in their physical bodies, the Bible didn't say they were changed. Why would we think it's so impossible for God to take off of the earth thousands of people instead of just two? I can assure you, if he can make a gate of pearl 216 feet square, he can certainly do this. The reference here to the kings could be a reference to the different positions that are going to actually be held, we mentioned a few weeks ago, by the redeemed. You may not look at yourself as being kings, but you're royalty. And someday you're going to rule and reign with the Lord. We have the promise, Revelation 5 and 10, it said, and he hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth the word reign here, that means we're going to finally have dominion over the earth. doesn't mean we're going to be here, but even if we're in the new city of Jerusalem, we're going to reign over the earth. We're finally going to have dominion that Adam lost in the beginning. It's not unreasonable to think that in the future, uh, somewhere in the future's eons of time, that the earth will eventually be divided up into nations again uh, that are going to be ruled by kings, people are going to reign over different nations or different divisions of people in different areas. And since the new earth is going to be changed from its present condition, we mentioned, I think it was last week that, or the week before, John said it was a place where there was no more sea. It's not going to be an earth like we know it now. So there's going to be room for hundreds of billions of people to live on the new earth. Brings up another question. What about children? Can you imagine a world without children? There's nothing said, not one verse of scripture, anywhere in the Bible that speaks of children in the new earth. Now some people, they can imagine a life with no kids. Some people can't stand kids. Most people that have their right mind, they love kids. They're a blast. 
Since the Bible doesn't say anything about children in the new earth, we're again left to our own speculation as to whether marriage, uh, the marriage relationship will even exist as we know it in that new world. It's open for speculation, but we can assume, we can make an assumption here, if God did intend such a relationship in the Garden of Eden, why would we think it would be any different in the eternal Eden that we're going to? Since these, uh, we have here kings and their nations mentioned, they're bringing, the Bible said, glory and honor into the new Jerusalem. Some suggest that that's further proof that the new city is going to be situated upon the earth and it's not going to be suspended in space as another planet. I want to show a couple of slides here. But again, uh, it's, we said last week, if we have glorified bodies, if we're kings and priests unto God, it won't matter whether the new Jerusalem is on the earth or if it's suspended somewhere in some kind of a heavenly orbit above the earth. Both of those are speculation. We don't know. But I do want to show a few slides here uh, concerning um, artist uh, renditions of what they believe that city is going to look like if you have those in the order uh, that I gave them to you. If you can imagine this, this is the description uh, showing how big, somebody said, well, how big's 1,500 miles square? Whether you're looking at it. That's a pretty big city. A little bit bigger than uh, New York, Chicago, Detroit, Dallas, Los Angeles. In fact, every city in the United States put them all together and they wouldn't fill up that space. It's, it's beyond our comprehension. Next, next picture. That's what it would look like if it was over the region of Israel, the biblical land. That's how big that would actually look in the European area. It's hard to imagine a city that that's, that's that big. Next picture. Now, if you look there, these bottom pictures here, and you can't already see it with this pointer, but the bottom here of that shows the different colors which is supposed to represent the foundation. Now, you can also see there's a city built on the top of that. If you notice closely there, you can see there's roofs on those, windows in those little houses. Can you go back to the last picture? Yeah, can anybody see that little house? Can you see that little tiny house there in that little neighborhood? No. And go back to the next picture. And you're not going to see houses on top of a square block like that either. If it's 1,500 miles square, you wouldn't even be able to tell there was anything there. It's beyond our ability to even comprehend. And this, from the foundation, is 1,500 miles up. Next picture. This is an artist's rendition showing this city. It's in a square, and it's coming down from God out of heaven. You notice that there's three gates on each of the sides. This is what most artist's depictions of it is going to look like, going to come down from God out of heaven. Now, some believe that it will come down and set directly upon the earth, and it's just going to be a 1,500-mile square, and the buildings are going to be 1,500 miles tall, and they believe that all those 12 floors, all you can see is the edge of them if you're at the side of it because that's all that's going to be shown. But most scholars or most people that I have read from in doing this study, they believe it's each one of those levels is another level. 120 to 125 miles up from the bottom floor will be the next floor. 120, 25 miles above that will be another floor and on and on until you've reached 1,500 miles. Next picture. This is a rendition, another artist's rendition of what it will look like. It is a little more detailed, though it doesn't show up good there, showing the 12 layers that are in there of the different city. Next picture. This is one showing it coming down. I thought this was a little uh, humorous. It's trying to show the glory of God. That's the bright light that you see there. And, and then it shows it's coming down over the Temple Mount area. <laughs> 33 acres of the Temple Mount area. And the city's going to come down and set right on the top of that. Now, if it came over, it would look like uh, a cloud cover. In fact, it would be a cloud cover. You would see nothing for 1,500 miles. So it certainly is an artist's rendition. Nobody can comprehend what it is. Do you have one more? Was that six? Okay, that's it. I had two more, but they're real corny, so I'm not going to show those. 
Verse 25. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. The gates and the walls of all ancient cities, they were for protection. They were to keep them safe from, from invading armies. And uh, that will not be the case in this city. This is not a city that's going to have invading armies. The gates of the ancient cities, they were only open during the day. They were closed at night to protect the inhabitants. Again, that will not be the case in this city. There will be no night there. For the scripture said, the Lord himself shall be the light of that city. The new Jerusalem is going to stand with gates open continually, inviting all of those that dwell there to come and receive the blessings of the Lord. Night has always symbolized in the scripture evil and sinfulness, but there'll be no evil or sinfulness there, and so there's not going to be any night there. It's going to be out of reach of the devil. The new creation is never going to know the sting of sin and death. Verse 26 said, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Now, verse 24, John spoke of the kings bringing their glory and honor to the city. Here we have reference possibly to the people themselves bringing glory and honor to this. The leaders uh, and the people of our nation today, I believe they could change our world if they would simply bring the glory and honor to God that he's worthy of. What if a nation would just turn around and say, we're going to stop all the immorality, we're going to take a stand against it, we're going to have laws that are against it, we're going to demand that everybody worship the one true God. Man, what a world this would, would be. What a nation this would be. In fact, what a city this would be. But it's never going to happen in this world. But the world that we're going to, it's going to be ruled by godly rulers. They're going to be ruling over godly people. What a combination. Sounds like a pretty easy job. Almost a sit down job, I suppose. Verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into Enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. This does not mean that there's still a slight chance. Maybe somebody might sneak in a gate and bring defilement to that city. No, John's emphasizing here, or at least the Lord is emphasizing through John, that this city is beyond the reach of any kind of wickedness or any kind of abominations. It's going to be perfect and free from any of that. Uh, the only one that will be there will those that have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They're the only ones that have access to that city. And they're going to be those that are living here on the earth, uh, they're going to have their names also written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that is a world we can only dream about now. I hope you dream about that. When you start thinking about what that's really going to be like, the things that God has prepared for the church, it ought to make us walk on egg eggshells all the time. We ought to be careful not to offend we ought to be careful about jealousy and bitterness and strife and contention and uh, this, this idea that we're never content and we're never satisfied. We ought to be so in love with what our future's going to be that we can endure anything so we don't have to miss that. The governments of men have long since failed, but when the government of God is set up, it's going to ensure happiness, joy, and peace to everyone that enters into that city. It's not going to be a government that's brought, brought uh, about by elections or the ballot box. Thank God. Seems like we've been in an election campaign for five years. But in that city, it's not going to be governments that are going to be uh, uh, overtaken by armed revolutions. This is going to be brought about by the, God, uh, the godly uh, uh, kingdom, those that rule and reign are godly. Those that dwell in the kingdom they're ruling and reigning over, they're godly. They're all under the same control of an all-loving, all-kind, sovereign God. 
It's not like nothing that we can even comprehend or imagine. To live in that city is going to be the highest honor humanity has ever been granted. I certainly don't want to miss that day. Next week, we're going to start in Revelation uh, chapter 22. It's going to be the last chapter of the last book of the Bible. We're going to discuss there the, rest, uh, the restoration of all things that have been lost for 7,000 years. The new creation is going to once again uh, place man in a new Eden. It's going to be a, a, a utopia that's going to cover the whole earth. And from here on out, it's going to be nothing but God and his people forever and ever and forever. And that's certainly what we're uh, hoping for, we're longing for is that day when we see the Lord face to face and hear him say, well done. If you'll stand with me tonight. We appreciate again everyone being in the house of the Lord. We're almost finished with this study. When we finish this, we'll take a little bit of a break so I can get caught up, get a few lessons um, ahead on the uh, Search for Truth Bible study. I've got a couple other things I want to teach before we get into that, but we're going to be starting that series as well. And uh, we're about to wrap this one up. It's been a long study, but I have enjoyed doing it. And uh, I hope when it's over, you'll have some kind of an insight uh, to what awaits us on the other side. The whole purpose, we've mentioned this in the beginning of the study, the book of Revelation should not be something that brings fear to us. It ought to bring excitement to us. It ought to bring a spirit of anticipation because that is what John saw at the end. I can't imagine after all he had been through and then he all of a sudden, he got to see what that city was going to be like. I can imagine that everything he went through in the past it just made him uh, look at that thinking it's certainly been worth it all. And the day that came when his death was drawing near, I suppose John thought with anticipation, I can't wait to take my last breath. That's the way I want to live. I want to live with the anticipation that he's got something better prepared for me on the other side. And I, that, if nothing else, that ought to be the reason that we serve God because we want to live with him eternally in that blissful place.